His work brought one of the world's most famous media empires to its knees. Journalist Nick Davies exposed illegal phone hacking and an abuse of power by newspapers owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. He details it all in his new book, Hack Attack, the inside story of how the truth caught up with Rupert Murdoch. He's in town as a special guest of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and we are delighted to welcome Nick to our studios right now. It's great to meet you. Good to meet you, I Steve. just love this book, i got to tell you. Okay, I but can I, handle that. <laughs> but I don't think I work in the same business as these folks. Uh, and I'll tell you yeah. why. Because you have described a newspaper industry in the United Kingdom that is dysfunctional, vile, corrupt, mm. unethical, mm. run by frightening, awful people. Was it always this way? I think we've got a pretty special history in the UK with our newspapers. They are peculiarly competitive and therefore peculiarly ruthless and potentially cruel in the way that they operate. And on occasion, as we found out, that involves them breaking the rules and systematically breaking the law. It's a funny thing as to why the UK is so much worse than other countries. And I have this theory, which might even be true, that it's to do with geography, that we've got 60 million people in the UK crammed into this very small space. And ever since the Industrial Revolution, you've been able to put a newspaper on a train in London or Glasgow, and overnight you can reach the entire population. Yeah, you really don't have local papers there, do you? No, in the so, way so we you've do got here. this seethingly profitable market. Mm -hmm. And so for the newspapers who are making their main money out of selling copies, not the posh papers who make their money out of carrying advertising, mm -hmm. they're out there and they're wrestling with each other, stabbing each other in the back to get their big share of this market. And well, the ruthlessness flows from that, whereas here, You've got a completely different market. You've got a smaller population scattered over a huge area. Mm -hmm. And until the electronic revolution, you put a, a newspaper on a train in Toronto and head it west at 10 o'clock in the evening, and by 5 o'clock the next morning, it's going to be in the middle of nowhere. So you've got city papers, mm -hmm. not, not this extraordinarily competitive national market. In fact, you write, if you want to understand what went wrong with British newspapers, there is a simple answer which consists of two words. <laughs> Kelvin McKenzie. Okay. Who's he? So Kelvin McKenzie was the editor of The Sun during the 1980s. And he is basically a clown with a notebook. He, he doesn't get it that there are rules or limits or boundaries. And uh, he, he, I mean, he was famous for making up stories as an editor. But also, crucially, his time in power at The Sun, Murdoch's big daily paper, coincided with the biggest human interest story in the world being on his doorstep, which was Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. And she's part of the downhill slope of the worst of our newspapers, that until she arrived, newspapers would treat, rightly or wrongly, they treat the royal family with a bit of deference, not, not get too close. But as a story, this fairy tale princess, where everything started to go wrong, she was irresistible. So they broke through the walls. They, they invaded everything about her life, including her sex life. And, and Kelvin McKenzie led the way on that. And once they'd done that, once, once they'd invaded the, the private life of the princess, then everybody's private mm. life was open to them. Well, and one of the ways in which you chronicle how it happened under the Rupert Murdoch empire mm. was, and this was astonishingly easy to do, they hacked into people's phone messages, into mm -hmm. their voicemail messages. Yeah. And you describe it in the book, and it, you know, I never would have imagined it was that easy, but it was. How did yeah. they do it? So it's very easy. So the idea is if you leave your mobile phone at home and you think, ah, I've got to check the messages, you can dial your own phone number from a landline and then it'll ask you to put in a four-digit PIN number. And most people don't change it from the factory setting. So the, the journalists rapidly discovered they could call somebody else's mobile and as long as they didn't answer, they could stick in the four-digit PIN and then they'd hear all the messages that had been left there. And it is a pathetically easy thing to do. I think there were school kids in the playground doing it. But this gave them such delightful, delicious access to people's private lives. Who's the they who was doing the, the it? They are the reporters on the tabloid newspapers. So the one that came to the forefront, which was at the heart of the scandal, was the News of the World, Rupert Murdoch's Sunday. But they were, were they the only ones doing no, it? No, no, there, there was plenty of it going on across that, the tabloid end of, of Fleet Street. And a certain amount of email hacking and a certain amount of breaking and entering and, I mean, quite dodgy criminal stuff Nobody going thought on. this was particularly unethical? Bribing police officers and prison officers, that was another mm. thing they were doing. I, I think they realised it was unethical and that they ought not to be caught at it. But curiously enough, I think they got so used to dealing with it that they actually lost sight of the fact that they were breaking the law and they were in jeopardy. It's interesting you say that they realised they ought not to be caught at it, not yeah. that they ought not to do it. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there, there was a real arrogance in that, that group of newspapers that... I mean, this is, this is what actually makes the story interesting, was that they perceived themselves to be above the law because in reality and practice, they were. Uh, and the, the, the thing that makes the story interesting is that it isn't just that the journalists were breaking the law, but that at a, at a certain point, the police, famous Scotland Yard, became aware of it, gathered an enormous amount of very detailed evidence of it, and then decided not to pursue it. How come? Because it's about power. So Rupert Murdoch's power in the UK is really very great. He runs four national newspapers and a national news channel. And... He's always thrown his weight around in the corridors of power. He, he also has a very particular kind of power, which is to do with fear. That It's odd, actually. Ordinary people aren't frightened of Rupert Murdoch. It's the people in the power elite who are, because they've all seen other members of the power elite having their sex life exposed by Murdoch's newspapers, which is a painful and humiliating experience. And so they've all learned to back off and try and placate him and so I don't think anybody had to say to the police, hey, don't investigate this, it might cause you trouble. They understood that it was better not to get, too, not to get into a fight. I think the, the term you used guy. is uh, monstering. Yeah, that's, what the, 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 that's the term that the tabloids use to describe their own attacks on people. And it and can be you know, a fierce, frightening, deeply painful experience to be monstered. Uh, Claire Short, yeah. politician, on the receiving yes. end of a monstering. Yes, yeah, she, she a was a, a, a Labour politician who was a feminist and who objected to the fact that Murdoch's newspapers were routinely publishing pictures of naked women. So she stood up and she said, that's, that's a bad idea, and tried to get a bit of a campaign going. And they went after her in a horrible way. I mean, they were, they were trying to... They tried to, to run a story saying that she'd had an affair with a gangster, which she hadn't. They tried to get pictures they'd heard of, of her posing in a negligee just to embarrass her. They ran a campaign asking their readers whether they would prefer to wake up to Claire Short's face or the back of a bus. Mm. I mean, just horrible, humiliating stuff. They were sending topless women round to her house. You know, it's, just, it's like a campaign of hatred to punish you for standing up. You, when, I gather when you first were tipped off about this phone hacking scandal mm -hmm. and all of the other terrible things that News of the World was doing, this Murdoch paper, you thought... OK, this is it's OK, but it's not a great story. What mm. made you pursue it? It is what we just referred to, that it very quickly becomes a story about power. And one particular thing was that the guy who'd been editing the news of the world when they were systematically breaking the law had left to become the right-hand man of David Cameron, who was then the leader of the Conservative Party, but very obviously in line to become the next Prime Minister. And then this guy, Andy Coulson, the former editor of the news of the world, was going to be in charge of communicating between our government and our people. And if the story which I was pursuing was correct, that meant that Andy Coulson had always been lying about the scale of crime in his newspaper. And the last place you want a liar is linking the government to the people of the country. So that, that seemed really, really wrong. And there was also a secondary fear there. What would happen if Andy Coulson got into power? There he is, the Prime Minister's right-hand man. If he began to suspect that politician close to Cameron was leaking secrets to a journalist. Mm. Would he hire private investigators to get inside their communications? As he did uh, for the paper. As he had done for the paper. So that, so that was a secondary reason for trying to, to stop that, uh, that guy's progress. As you wrote about this story and, <clears throat> and got it out there into the ether, mm -hmm. what kind of feedback did you get? We did the first big story back in July 2009. And we, we ran into aggression. So first of all, the assistant commissioner of Scotland Yard stepped out in front of the headquarters there and told a big press conference, essentially, that I and The Guardian had got it wrong and the news of the world hadn't done anything seriously wrong. And that was a deeply, deeply misleading statement to make. And they were sitting on evidence that what we were saying was true. OK. And then the Murdoch company in the UK put out a statement which accused us of deliberately misleading the British people. So this then became a war of words. We were chugging away trying to get the story out and being quite heavily assaulted. I mean, only verbally, I don't mean physically. And it reached a point like where that assistant commissioner got the most aggressive law firm in London to start suing us. And I wasn't the only person trying to uncover the scandal. There was um, a couple of members of parliament, one of them, Tom Watson, who's just become the deputy leader of the Labour Party, we discovered that the Murdoch company hired a private investigator who specialises in covert surveillance to follow Tom Watson and secretly video him because they thought he was having an affair 
so that they could expose and humiliate him. And you know... there was no, some... he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't having an right. affair. No, you're quite right to ask me that. And th there were some public figures who discovered that they had been hacked and who started to sue. And this was very threatening to the Murdoch company because the court was going to order the police to disclose the evidence that they were concealing. So in the same way, they hired the same private investigator to follow the two lawyers who were, who were representing those hacking victims to try and catch them out, having sex with somebody they weren't supposed to, to discredit them and humiliate them. So there were some dirty games going on. You got called up to the House of Commons to be, what's the expression, barbecued? <laughs> to be barbecued, well, yeah. What, what does that mean? So this was after that first story we did in July 2009. <laughs> The Murdoch company used some of its political allies in the House of Commons to call me and my editor in front of a select committee. And the reason they did that was because when we published the story, we had sources, human sources, who were talking to us. We had documentary sources, bits of paper, but we weren't allowed to, to quote any of them. So when they read it, being newspaper people, they thought, aha, these guys can't prove that what they're saying is true. So we were called up in front of this committee, and the idea was that we would be ruined. That the, the, their friends on the committee would say, how do you know this is true? Can you prove a word of it? And we would be unable to defend ourselves. But in the event, just on the eve of that committee meeting, a key source authorised me to use some bits of paper. Mm -hmm. So we were able to turn it around. It was quite weird, that committee hearing, because it's very formal in the House of Commons. And I was sitting there next to my editor, who is my friend, Alan Rusbridger. And he knows from past experience that quite often my mouth moves much quicker than my brain. <laughs> so just before we were going to be questioned, he said to me, I I'm just worried that you might go over the top, so I'm just going to put my hand on your knee and squeeze it if, if you start to do anything wrong. So it was very distracting that I was trying to justify our position to these members of Parliament with the distracting sensation of my editor's fingers <laughs> trailing up my inner thigh. But we handled it. But you handled it. Yep. Here's an excerpt from the book. By November 2009, I had spent four months since The Guardian's original story about crime at News of the World trying to break through Murdoch's defenses. But News International, Scotland Yard, the Director of Public Prosecutions, and the Press Complaints Commission had all stepped forward like well-drilled guardsmen and told the world that we were wrong. I kept trying, but the truth is that a lot of the shots I fired missed their targets or simply bounced harmlessly off the barricades. Mm -hmm. What was the turning point? When did the shots really start to hit? Well, I think we started to make slow progress, and they were on the defensive, and they were very frightened. But you, you may know there was this breakthrough moment after two years where we discovered that among the other victims of this phone hacking was a 12-year-old schoolgirl called Millie Dowler, who some nine years earlier had been abducted and murdered. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the tipping point where, I mean, I think the dam was about to burst, but that story had an emotional impact. The people had followed that for a long time. Yeah. And they felt awful for this family. Yes, and the key thing was that while we were doing these stories in The Guardian, other newspapers were refusing to follow the story, even though it really was quite big because it led straight to David Cameron's office. And th that story, the Millie Dowler story, was so powerful that finally the other newspapers had to stop pretending that this wasn't happening. Just to explain, the other newspapers wouldn't join in, partly because well, some of them were owned by Rupert Murdoch, some of them had been committing the same crimes, hmm. and a few of them, even if they didn't have the Murdoch and the crime factor, were supporters of the Conservative Party and didn't want to do stories that embarrassed them. Hmm. But the story about the missing schoolgirl pulled in those other newspapers, and then, you, then it appears to me they knew interesting stuff which they had been suppressing because the next day one of those newspapers the daily telegraph revealed that after the the bombings in the london underground system in july 2005 the news of the world had hacked the voicemail messages of the families of those who had been murdered and mutilated and that is just as shocking and horrifying as millie dowler and the following day the same daily telegraph reported that the families of british soldiers who'd been killed in afghanistan had had their, their phones hacked. And A, the, the, you've got this chain reaction of emotional impact now. The whole thing is going to explode. But also what was kind of weird looking back was that the Telegraph was able to produce those stories so quickly that I was tempted to believe they'd always had that information and had been sitting on it. Hmm. But anyway, it was hugely powerful, that chain reaction. And we should do one more follow-up on, on the, the Dowler child because mm -hmm. the I, I gather the idea was that, that there was 
there were voicemails on her phone yeah. which gave the impression that she might still be alive, which gave false hope to her parents. So a particularly dastardly thing to do to her parents. Have I got that sort of right? Not quite. Not quite? <laughs> so, um, deleted voicemail that, messages. That's what it is. The yeah. messages were being deleted from mm -hmm. her voicemail. And this gave the mother the false hope that her child must be alive and doing the deleting. Right. And th that particular aspect of the story subsequently was cast into doubt um, because the story had such impact that the police opened an inquiry and they dug deep into the archive of the paperwork from the period when she'd originally been abducted. And, and that muddied the water. It, it, it isn't clear that those messages were being deleted by the News of the World, as we had all originally thought. Mm. It's possible that they were being deleted automatically. So in that respect, one part of the story is, is, is in doubt. But the key part, that she had been hacked, was confirmed. We need to bring up a name now that we haven't mentioned yet, but yeah. somebody who clearly is a huge player in all of this. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. Yes. You want to talk about Rebecca Brooks and what her significance is? First of all, who is she and her significance in the whole British power st structure? <laughs> okay. Re Rebecca Brooks is a, an amazing character. So she rose up from the lowest level of the Murdoch company in the UK, where she was a secretary in a newsroom, up to be the editor of the News of the World, and then the editor of the Daily Paper, The Sun, and then to be the chief executive of Murdoch's UK company, overseeing all four newspapers. She is an amazingly charismatic character. I mean, somebody who didn't like her would say she's extremely manipulative. But... I mean, you know, she's a journalist, she's an operator. So she was, for example, very close friends with our Prime Minister, Tony Blair, and with his greatest political rival, Gordon Brown, who took over from him, and with Gordon Brown's greatest political rival, David Cameron. And it takes a certain kind of brilliance to be able to do that. So as these stories broke, Rebecca Brooks was arrested and marched out of the building uh, at, the, at the time when she was chief executive. She was put on trial at the Old Bailey, charged with organising voicemail hacking and with organising the bribing of public officials and with destroying evidence. At the end of the trial, the jury said she's not guilty of any of those things. And she went quiet for a year or two, and now just very recently, Murdoch has reappointed her to the job she had as chief executive of his UK company before everything fell apart. So th that's quite a turnaround of events. I think... It's important to say that she's entitled to her verdicts of not guilty. I sat all through that trial. Eight months it went on. I was sitting opposite the jury, who were amazingly attentive. And I think they returned the right verdict, that based on the evidence in that trial, uh, they, they could not possibly convict her, and they were right to say she was not guilty. And there are a lot of people in the UK who will say, ah, oh, well, she must have done it. And I don't think that's OK. I, don't th I think we should accept jury verdicts unless we know that there's been something really corrupt going on. OK, but let's not talk law. Let's talk ethics. OK. Uh, the mm. law may have said you're not guilty. Yeah. Ethically speaking, she used her newspapers over the years to go after people's personal lives and yeah. try to destroy people. Yeah. And what was she doing all the while? OK, now this, uh, I, th I think you have a point there, that for years she, as editor of one of these papers, and Andy Coulson, as editor of the News of the World, had destroyed the careers and maybe lives of public figures when they exposed them for having extramarital affairs. And yet that trial disclosed that over a period of eight years, on and off, the two of them had been having an extramarital affair with each other. And that, that really was breathtaking, that they could destroy people while for doing something that they themselves were doing. And I think it creates a problem now. There she is, chief executive of these newspapers, they have drifted back into the business of exposing people's sex lives and extramarital affairs. But, so th the first time they do that when Rebecca is chief executive, people were going to say, well, hang on, how is, how is this possible? How can you possibly complain about this person doing what your own chief executive was doing? So I think that, that causes a problem that she's back in charge with that history. The other thing that emerged during the trial was that she was compelled to admit that from a very early stage, even though she wasn't committing the crime herself, she had known that it had been committed on a very great scale and that she had taken part in what we would call a cover-up. She had to admit this on oath because it was there in paperwork, which was disclosed. Now, the fact that she, th th that, that cover-up took place cost Murdoch's parent company something like £300 million, say five or $600 million. And furthermore, if we're to believe what Murdoch has said himself uh, in evidence on oath, he was himself a victim of that cover-up. 
right, that, that Rebecca and the others in London hid it from him. So it's a very, very strange decision to reappoint somebody who has admitted on oath that they played that part. And you might think that the shareholders would be a little bit worried. But I want to add one final thing. Sure. I don't want to give the impression that I'm against her. I think she suffered a lot. She, she, for three years, she was out in the wilderness facing the prospect of imprisonment. And personally, I think that's enough. I, I don't think it's a reporter's job to send people to prison. I, you, know, I, you, you report stories because you want facts to come out and issues to be aired. But like she we, did do a lot of bad stuff. I mean, I know, but I, 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 I wouldn't take any great pride or pleasure in sending people to prison. I, like, if you talk to the people who, who exposed the Mike Duffy story, mm -hmm. right? They've done that because they wanted to expose what was going on in the corridors of power. Well, now I know Duffy's trial isn't finished yet. Supposing he's convicted, I'm not sure. I don't know these reporters, mm -hmm. but are they actually going to say, "Hey, we sent a guy to prison"? I'm not sure that that's what we're after no, I hear in you. our job. I hear you. Did you, in your travels, find a smoking gun that said, "Aha, uh -huh, Rupert knew all this was going on in his name"? And there's the proof. No, it's the short story. His defense is I was too high up the tree to see what was going on down on the ground. And, and that rings true? It's very often the case. I mean, if you go back to the Mike Duffy saga, that's what your prime minister is saying, mm -hmm. isn't it? So, and, and then if you're the reporter on the outside, you can have a view, but, but a view isn't enough. You need evidence. And that's, that's quite a difficult wall to break through. The, uh, well, let me say just one thing about Murdoch. Sure. I think he understood in principle what his reporters were up to. You know, he and his lawyers started handing over a lot of information to the police in London, as a result of which a lot of his reporters got arrested. They were therefore pretty fed up with him. He came over to London, there was a meeting, and because they're tabloid reporters, they secretly tape recorded him talking to them. And in the course of that, he said, what's wrong with bribing police officers? I mean, it's always gone on. So there he is tape recorded, acknowledging mm. that in principle, at least, he understood that it was going on. And I think certainly at that level, he, he can't get out of it. I mean, he said it on tape. But I, I, as to the precise detail of what was going on day by day, week by week, psh, he probably didn't know. He's too far away. His decision to make all this go away was mm. to shut down News of the World. Yeah. He closed down a newspaper that had been around for a very, very long time. Yeah. Was that, do you think that was his best option? It was very selfish, ruthless decision. Uh, we were really shocked at The Guardian. We hadn't expected it or wanted it, let alone campaign for it. I thought it was, it was deeply unjust, because if you look at that newspaper, there might have been as many as, say, a dozen people who were actively involved in organizing crime, and maybe another dozen who might have been involved in obeying orders. But 200 people lost their jobs. So the vast majority of them had nothing to do with this. But the problem went away for him. Well, not quite, because what he was trying to do was, you know, at the same time as the hacking scandal erupted, he was in the very final stages of pulling off the biggest deal of his whole career, right. which was to take over all of this hugely lucrative um, broadcast satellite, satellite broadcast organization, B Sky B. Mm -hmm. And he could see that the hacking scandal was beginning to infect his chances of getting that deal through with the government regulator. And I, it, we, there was some email disclosed at the big trial which showed that it was a, it was a big political move. If we, if we chuck away the news of the world, maybe we can chuck away the hacking scandal and still clench the deal. And did it work? It didn't work because the scandal had got too bad. But it's a very, very selfish thing to do, to throw 200 people out of work just mm. to secure a bigger deal. Uh, eventually, the British government got involved. They appointed Judge Levison to mm -hmm. hold an inquiry. Uh, was that worth doing, that inquiry? Anything yeah, come of I that? thought it's, it's a weird thing being a reporter. You know, you put information into the public domain and then you can't predict or control what happens. So a newspaper closing like that is, is a bad result. But I thought the, the Leveson inquiry was wonderful. The actual inquiry that day by day, week after week, we were allowed to see into the corridors of power. There were, I think, four prime ministers called to give evidence on oath and very senior officials and chief constables and those most secretive beasts of all, newspaper editors. And, and they were told, you sit there, we're all going to watch, you're on oath, here are some text messages that we've, you've been ordered to disclose, here are some emails. Now you tell us the way it really works. I know that was brilliant, to be allowed to see what really goes on in the world of power. And he produced a good report, a, a very sensible, subtle way of trying to help newspapers to regulate themselves, to stick to the code of conduct. But of course there are certain newspapers who would <laughs> give their eye teeth not to have to obey their own code of conduct. So they've kicked it into touch. But uh, kicked it into touch. That's one of those British expressions, I guess? Yeah, that means kicking the ball off the field. Out of bounds. I got it. Sorry. I got it. But it did reveal that there was a far too close relationship between politicians and media yep. that 
that all politicians were terrified of going after Murdoch, even Labour politicians. Ed Miliband wouldn't go after him, right? Even he was afraid that the thing would... Yeah. At the last moment when the scandal erupted, right. Miliband did, did stand up and challenged his power. Is that, and, and Murdoch it, never forgave him for it. Well, is that, is that where we're at now in British politics, where there's, uh, yeah. politicians are still terrified of this guy and yeah, he gets certainly. away with everything? Yes, so we had a general election in the UK in May of this year, mm -hmm. and in, during the campaign, the Murdoch newspapers and others joined in what was essentially a political project to smear the Labour Party and its leadership in order to persuade their readers not to vote in a Labour government. And, you know, that, that's not really journalism as it's understood. But because it worked. Yeah, it did. And you know, you'll know that the Labour Party has now elected a new leader who's very left wing, Jeremy mm -hmm. Corbyn, and he's being monstered from all sides. I mean, they started off by getting inside his sex life and saying that years ago he'd had an affair as his first marriage was ending. And they did a whole thing about behind the Iron Curtain, the Reds are in bed with whoever. <laughs> I mean, it's just really, really low game they're playing here, just going after people's sex lives to try to reduce their status. So, to, so that people will be put off voting for them. So that power game is still going on. Having uh, written 400 pages now on one of the worst chapters in uh, mm -hmm. British media history, are you any more hopeful about how things are going to happen going forward? No, I mean, that's, that's, the, tra that's the weakness of being a reporter. It, or it's the weakness of words, isn't it? So you can fire words at very powerful people. And on the whole, they can ignore you and carry on regardless. Po power tends to hang on to power. And words, generally speaking, aren't enough to kind of release the fingers from their grasp mm. on it. It's a great read. It reads like a Mickey Spillane crime novel, which of course <laughs> it sort of is because it's all there. Hack Attack, the inside story of how the truth caught up with Rupert Murdoch. Nick Davies, great to have you here at TVO. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.